Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 730. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's May 3rd, 2022. Welcome to another program of Anglican Scripture. We're glad you could be here. You're going to sit down for the next, it could be 10 minutes, it could be 50 minutes, to listen to Kevin and George talk about the news that's out there. And yeah, it's another slow week. We'll see what we can serve you. Supreme Court stuff, Church of Wales stuff, Canadian tour stuff. It'll be fun. But uh, before we get there, George, how are you doing this week? I am on top of the world. I had a uh, former parishioner stop by this morning. I hadn't seen him in four years. Wonderful fellow. He's one of these people that I not only love as a parishioner, but like as a person. And he came by to say uh, he had met a woman a few years ago, and uh, she went to another church in another denomination, and she sort of pulled him away from us. But he came here this morning, said they'd like to get married, and they want us to do it, and and he, I think he's going to be coming back to worship with us. So that's great. Well, yeah. it's just such a you know wonderful thing to see and uh, see someone so very happy and getting married for the second time at the age of eighty-six. Oh my gosh! Uh, oh. <laughs> wow, so, that's amazing. I, so I'm I'm not going to have to counsel them on uh, you know the care and nurture of children and oh. some stuff. But, yeah. Uh, Wow. But it's exciting day. Yeah. It's why I love being a parish priest, and especially a priest in a long-term uh, placement. And that uh, in eight years, you, you know, I've seen people oh, as their lives go on, and I've been there in several, you know, life events as you know, that we all have in our in our aging and whatnot. And just to uh, be a witness to travel alongside people in their life is just a gift from God. Yeah, That's when you're in a long-term parish, there's, there's, it's a different development than you have in a, if you're in a parish two or four or six years. But to be a, a 10, 15, 20, uh, the, the last priest in Watertown at the Roman Catholic Church was there like 40 years. You know, why, that's an amazing relationship when you're getting to the, the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of a family dynamic. And the now there are drawbacks because people do get in ruts people do get burned out and and sometimes people should be moved on for the church's good but i well, think in general the benefits outweigh the disadvantages i really do what you don't want is the people who do keep showing up on easter and then complain that you're in the right of all you do is preach on the resurrection you know so oh. <laughs> I don't. I don't mind that, Kevin, because at least they're coming back for Easter. They are. They come back Easter. year after year. Yeah. Oh, All right, my. so let's hit the news um, first. Yeah, I, I hear the AC turn on and back, so I'll turn that off in a second here. But I want to get to the news because the biggest news going on right now is there was a leak on an upcoming decision. This is me turning off the AC and back. You're going to start to see sweat droplets on my face. That's that's just normal. Um, and I'm going to smile it. throughout all the sad <laughs> yes. stories because I'm still in a good mood about sure. the pastoral, pastoral situation we have. Well, this is this is a difficult topic because our nation is divided on abortion. You know, fifty-fifty. Not most people. Some people believe that there should be a access to women for health care purposes to have an abortion. Some people believe that abortion is the murder of a fetus, a pre-born person. And, you know, in that psychology, in that dynamic, we in America have had abortion as the rule of law since 1973 and have either provided health care access for 70 million abortions or we've allowed the murder of 70 million pre-born people. You know, th there's that dynamic. So th this issue has gone before the Supreme Court several times. This time, through a leaked document, we find out that the Supreme Court has voted by majority to overturn Roe v. Wade and the other one. Was, uh, Casey. Casey. Uh. And wow. Now... In my lifetime, I never expected it to be overturned. I knew it should be something that was always a state's rights issue. 
Uh, I'm a original constitutionalist. Uh, I was raised that way. The schools I went to taught that, uh, that most big issues like this should be decided by the states, if decided at all. So now by that's the people happen. in the, by, by the people, the people of mm -hmm. the states. Yep. So here we go. This is going to be a rough summer. This is, you know, <laughs> politically. But let's first talk about how extraordinary a Supreme Court leak is, George. This is the first ever to have occurred that is known of. Uh, so this is actually, for the pro-life movement, this is excellent news. Mm -hmm. For the good government movement, this is the worst crisis that can ever be imagined. There's only one thing that could be worse, to find that one of the government, one of the judges was on the take uh, or yeah. sold their vote. But apart from that, this is as bad as it gets because the Supreme Court is supposed to be be above partisanship. It's supposed to be above the political free for all that is the legislature and the executive. And well, I'll, I'll give you some. Of the, I don't know what happened, but some of the talking heads, for instance, Alan Dershowitz, the Harvard professor, uh, says that he believes that this was leaked by one of the clerks on the Supreme Court, and who well, which which is obvious somebody there had to leak it it didn't just appear on the desk of the president yeah well let, let's just the who would have had now we may be getting our head of ourselves for those yeah. who haven't turned on the tv this morning so i'll give you a little background the supreme court has a draft opinion they've voted amongst themselves and the majority have called have agreed to uh overturn Roe versus Wade and they've assigned the uh, writing of the opinion to Justice Alito and this draft opinion will then be circulated amongst the ju uh, amongst the justices who will either sign off or write a concurring opinion or a dissenting opinion but the majority already are in favor of it so that is being reported as done how it will eventually work itself out the only people who will see this are the justices themselves and their clerks. There are approximately 40 law clerks. Mm -hmm. So it, they're not copies left in the waste paper basket for people to pick up. It's not sent to the printers uh, to be printed in the government reports yet. So the actual, and there are no, and the clerks are the secretaries or typists here. There are no, the only people and who could have done this are either a justice themselves or a clerk and so alan dershowitz is saying it was a clerk the power line blog which uh, alan haley pointed us to this morning uh is suggesting that it was sonia sotomayor the justice because she is a a political just judge and the speculation it is that a liberal clerk, either with or without the knowledge, uh, and already people are naming one of Sotomayor's clerks, uh, who was very active in the campaign against Justice Kavanaugh when they were a student at Yale Law School, uh, for basically to shame the other justices to show what uh, free-for-all there will be so that one of the sort of less uh, courageous judges to avoid the, the the rioting if you will will basically switch their vote um, so those are the opinions we mm -hmm. until they catch the person the Supreme Court has put out a press release saying we have no comment but I certainly assume that Justice uh, Supreme the Chief Justice uh, Roberts uh, who is an institutionalist he, he, is. Li he likes to play the game where mm -hmm. he wants to support obama he wants to in other words he'll basically give a decision that is in the best interests of the court but, well i would say the company he would the company. He, he's a company man yeah and the he, company is, yeah. is the supreme the reputation of the supreme court mm -hmm. now it's telling that he did not is not been asked to write the draft meaning he was in the minor minority Mm -hmm. He voted with the liberal wing, people are assuming. But he loves the court and its uh, prerogatives and its reputation. 
So I bet you he's sitting down with the U.S. Marshal Service this morning saying, I want you to confiscate every cell phone belonging to all the clerks, and we're going to track down who leaked this to Politico. Yeah. Politico is an online publication, and though it is left-leaning, it has a reputation for being an actual journalistic site. So that it's, it's not, not CNN, so much- it's not MSNBC, it's not Fox News. It, they do peer, you know, they do ten left, but they are journalism. Yeah. So, the in other words, even if they had a single leaker, mm-hmm. they would still want to confirm this with somebody else. So you may have one or more clerks or a judge, justice involved. Mm-hmm. And the decision is that the original Roe versus Casey was, according to the draft of by Justice Alito, it was illogical and badly argued and made out of whole cloth a right that does not exist. From the right what, to privacy, you went to abortion rights. Which even liberal judges and, and legal scholars would tell you, it's a poorly written law, we know that. And we've been lucky so far you know that luck has run out for them so Mm -hmm. do they do they go to the congress and the senate and have them repass a a a bill to allow abortion which should have been what they did the first time they shouldn't have gone to the supreme court that was ridiculous or um do they just let this settle and and do states rights and so you know well there there are for that the senate has to basically federalize abortion law Mm -hmm problem is right now that it won't pass because it's a 50 50 senate right now and senator the democratic senator from west virginia uh, joe manchin Mm -hmm. uh it said he's not going to support it so the democrats don't have the vote to push through national abortion laws they do in the house of representatives but not in the senate but you need two houses Mm -hmm. uh so for but kevin i think you raised an important point this does not end abortion in the united states it sends it to each of the states to decide how to do this it this will hinder abortion it won't stop abortion this will make abortion more difficult it won't stop abortion if you really want to have an abortion you can still get an abortion the good thing in my opinion here i'm a i'm pro-life to the nth t is that it makes it more difficult and people will now have to, to th- think more about that decision. Do I want to travel six hours or take a plane trip somewhere to have an abortion? But this will also be an abortion tourist uh, uh, industry sh- that will pop up. Fly to Seattle, spend the weekend here, go gambling here, get your abortion here, and then fly back home. And right, because we, you know, let's take the four largest states. Mm-hmm. New York and California will mm-hmm. certainly have abortion on demand laws florida and texas will have very restrictive abortion laws and what a restrictive abortion law means is that for the health of the mother and in cases of severe fetal abnormality not a cleft palate uh by the way but Mm. in other words what the laws were what the custom was before all this took place and and maybe one or two states will have a complete ban on abortion we don't know but probably three quarters two-thirds of the states will eliminate abortion as it is practiced nationally but there were the liberal if you will coastal states states plus illinois and maybe minnesota that will uh still have abortion and so if you live in Miami and you desire an abortion, it costs you a hundred bucks to hop on a plane to New York. Mm-hmm. And so there's freedom of movement, freedom of access, and it's actually cheaper to fly to New York than it is to take to drive to Orlando with gas prices and everything. One of the things that I, as I follow the abortion industry and follow the pro-life movement, I've seen the argument go in the last 10 or dozen years from the science strictly to the rights. This is a woman's right. There was always kind of this middle argument, uh, is the child alive? Is a heartbeat enough? Is, is feeling enough? When does life begin? Was always a, an argument. But that has not been an argument at all within the pro-abortion industry 
for you know like i said 10 years they just go strictly for the right because for them that's been a winning argument how dare you take away rights especially a woman's right and especially a, a woman's right to choose um in this nation of america our greatest thing is we get to choose things and so it by changing that argument from is it alive is it a person is it sentient um to is it a right has really undermined uh a lot of the pro-life movement in the 80s and 90s they weren't able to keep up with that well i think two re two things come to mind quickly the first is that the rights argument is identical to the rights argument advanced by uh john c calhoun and the mm -hmm. slave owners yeah, before absolutely. the civil war yeah. slavery was a right you cannot abridge a right that exists Okay, even though and they're so, human, you would, they're human, they're four-fifths human. They're not all human. And because of that, um, they don't have the same rights. Yeah. yeah. And the second thing, because it was federalized and taken out of the public square in the legislature for debate, conservatives and liberals on this have never really talked to each other. Mm -hmm. They've only talked through the soundbite and the press because there's never... There's not been a forum or facility for this to be debated. Um, people say, what do you mean? People are talking about it for years, but they're not talking to it each other. Because it now goes to the legislatures, that means people in the legislature will have to advance the arguments. And it is the arguments about human rights, about science, about morality and ethics, and the woman's right of control over her body and all those things for there to be a full and f frank discussion and i think that's the only way the issue will be resolved not by having the government say this is it and that's no more we stop talking so this is for the pro-life movement uh when their arguments are heard uh and that's very hard in the in, a, in the liberal media and in the liberal university settings when their arguments are heard and put head to head against the, the pro-abortion arguments, they usually prevail and convince people. I certainly saw that in my own children, who you know, products of very liberal universities in the last five, six years. Mm -hmm. Once they get out into the real world and sort of talk and see, and you know, for one daughter was seeing the film Silent Screen, Scream about sure. the, yeah. the pain that a, a uh, fetus, a baby, uh, in utero feels when it's being murdered mm -hmm. so it's a win politically and morally because it allow it because it will allow i believe eventually this to be resolved in favor of the rights of the unborn but for our country and for our demo for our institutions how it occurred this leak it's uh it's a tragedy. Hmm. It it's, it besmirches the reputation of the Supreme Court by saying, essentially, they are now no better than Congress. Well, I mean, the presidency and the executive branch has no reputation. The uh, ju judicial branch has no reputation up until the Supreme Court had a reputation, and now, yeah, that's been searched. Um, that's gone. The legislature, well, they never had a good reputation. So, you know. The, wokeness has, has besmirched the final reputation of one of the last form of our government the supreme court i agree yeah absolutely so you know this will be a continuing news uh story for us uh throughout the summer i don't know if there's gonna be riots i don't know what's gonna happen um i do know that if i were a liberal and i were on the other side i would make this the number one news item until somebody gets scared enough to change their vote and that happened with a certain justice in a certain other case not too long ago, Mr. Roberts. All right, let's move on to our talk about, ooh, there's good news out there. There is a new bishop in Pittsburgh, and I thought we could talk about that real quick. Um, the candidates were Peter Frank, Joel Scranlett, and... Alex Warner. Cameron. Yeah. Alex Cameron. Alex Cameron is the new bishop-elect. He was elected in the first round, and uh, wow, I didn't see that coming. Not that I, I have any 
predictions of the future of this type of thing and i i suspect he'll do a good job you know so well martin martin Minns, who's the uh the interim bishop uh, released a statement saying he was surprised how quickly the convention came to its con- decision on the first ballot where he achieved a majority in the lay and clergy houses but the spirits seems clearly to have spoken this um, wasn't a case of overnight there was an extra 132,000 votes cast or anything. This was just a, a straight up first round. And that, we we appreciate something like that to have that context and that resolution in a, a, a diocese like Pittsburgh who you know, kind of had somebody to replace Bob Duncan. That didn't work out as well. Now they're, they're trying again and it's good to see that resolution there. They have three candidates, Joel Scandrett from Trinity Seminary is an academic, Peter Frank from Church of the Epiphany in Chantilly, Virginia, is from the Diocese of Pittsburgh uh, before he went down to Virginia, mm-hmm. um, is a uh, practical parish priest, and Alex Cameron who has parish experience and is currently heading a, uh, uh, I think the Isaiah initiative, Some he's hitting a program out in Chicago. Now, of the three, I had never heard of Alex Cameron. I knew Peter Frank very well, and I had met Joel Scandrick a sure, number of Joel's, times. Yeah. So my uh, prognostication skills were skewed because I would have, I, in my mind, I thought, well, here's the person, if I was voting, I would vote for because I know two of the three, and I know who I would have voted for. So I was surprised by the outcome. It was a bit of a shocker. Well, what does it say about Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh had Bob Duncan for a very long time. He was uh, consecrated in 95. Uh, he was there for almost, what, 18, 20, 20, yeah, years? 20 years? Almost, yeah. He, and before that, he had been canon to the ordinary for Alden Hathaway. So mm-hmm. Bob was a presence in Pittsburgh for a very, very long time. Followed by a second bishop who was not as strong as Bob and got himself in, in some sort of trouble not moral trouble or not anything, he, he, just he, mis- yeah. mismanagement. So now they've elected someone. They had a choice of an academic, a working priest, or sort of someone In on Adam. the pastor's side. Yeah. Yeah. And they chose the pastor. So what does that mean from a third party perspective? I think Pittsburgh is looking for a place of healing and recentering. And the fellows our age, uh, so he's got 10 years uh they they weren't see peter frank had been elected he'd be there for 25 years and maybe they weren't ready for that whereas somebody who's in their late 50s they give them 10 12 years uh joel scandrick's in his 40s so i I think i think they went with the pastor with the shorter time frame sure who knows? Well, they did go with the pastor. Obviously, you think they did, yeah. Right. So, yeah. Uh, once again, it would be an uh, interesting report on that. Uh, I don't know if they've scheduled the uh, uh, consecration yet, but uh, uh, keep posted. We'll let you know what's going on here on Anglican Script as that takes place. Uh, ooh, we posted this at Anglican.inc. Uh, there's lots of new viewers every week. And to let you know, Anglican Unscripted is a sister program to the website Anglican.inc. And we talk about a lot about the articles that George posts there over the week. And George, you posted a story about Nazar Ali uh, giving a speech at the Prayer Book Society uh, meeting last week. And it's something to talk about because I don't know why they did it. Well, uh, we have to give credit to Dennis Lennox, mm-hmm. one of our viewers, who sent us a copy of a tweet, uh, a tweet exchange, Twitter exchange. The Prayer Book Society on Twitter published a uh, news report about their about a service in Gloucestershire on St. George's Day. And the preacher at the Evensong service was Michael Nazarali. And I looked on the website and they gave an account of the service and Michael Nazarali talked about martyrdom and this and that. He didn't say anything objectionable as far as I can see. But for those who don't know, Michael Nazarelli was one of the leaders of the Ang- Anglican. He was GAFCON leader. He was a Church of England leader. And in September of last year, he entered the Roman Catholic Church. This was a bit of a shocker. 
And the prayer book society is there to uphold and support the Anglican formularies, the prayer book of the uh, church. And to have someone who has repudiated the formularies and the prayer book and the doctrines contained therein to become a Roman Catholic. Dennis Lennox pointed out, why are you doing this? And the prayer book society said, well, it would, we'd all, he'd been invited before he became a Catholic and it would have been rude to disinvite him. And then it went on to with some sort of little specious thing. Well, maybe his ha, our having a non-Anglican be the preacher at a service celebrating the prayer book will encourage other non-Anglicans to open the prayer book. That's probably the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Well, but, you cool. know, well, it, A for effort. Uh, it, but, I mean... I think, do they have a counter to this called the Missile Society? I don't know if the Roman Catholics have uh, something like that, but you know, in reality, the prophecy that Michael Nazarali was going to be the, the step forth leader of all these Anglicans going over to the Roman Catholic Church uh, this year hasn't happened. And uh, he, once he was kind of that lone stepping stone, I'm going and I'm going for these reasons, I expect people to follow, and as far as I can tell, other pensioners may have followed, but it was not a uh, great uh, following event into the Roman Catholic Church. Yes, and we got into some uh, trouble with some viewers who were telling, because Kevin and I both, we both said that, you know, this is about a man, not about a movement no yeah and we had people responding on the comment section and in emails to us that, that this is the start of the great realignment this is the second newman if you will uh, right. moving to catholicism we're going to see a huge movement now along the same time jonathan goodall who was one of the flying bishops in the church of england he became a catholic and uh, peter forster a retired bishop of chester moved up to Scotland and quietly became a Roman Catholic. But there was no real link with those two and Michael Nazarelli. And since September of last year, there has been no wave of conversions or receptions or anything like that. And I think we're justified in our saying that Michael Nazarelli's conversion was about a man and his own journey Absolutely. rather than the church our church itself but the issue uh, the issue what was the prayer book society thinking when it had Michael Nazarelli stay as the preacher because they had over six months to find somebody else uh, Michael Nazarelli was all set to, could, to contribute a chapter I believe or even a book to the uh, new yes, series yeah. that's coming out by the, uh, I think it's Anglican House Publishing or whatever, yep. uh, about Anglican stuff. And they basically said to Michael, thanks, but no thanks, we don't need your book anymore. Because how have, having someone who rejects some of the things about Anglicanism, its uniqueness, writing this, it being part of the series about the uniqueness of Anglicanism. It, it's, it's one thing for the Catholic write about it, but it's another to have a convert from Anglicanism writing about Anglicanism in uh, that context of a teaching series. And I wonder if part of the there not being a, a great movement in this is he was able to articulate what was wrong with Anglicanism. He was not able to articulate what was right with Roman Catholicism. You know, when, when he, would he explain why, hey, this is why I'm out of here. Anglicanism is it's going downhill it's shot it may not work it you know well what about the Roman Catholics yeah that's where I'm going that's that's so no what's good about them no I'll be what's good about them okay whatever it's like so he he never articulated what was good about the Roman Catholic Church he was able to quickly precisely articulate what was wrong with Anglicanism I and I don't disparage what he said about Anglicanism yeah, I mean, you and I basically agreed with all of his uh, critiques of Anglicanism, yeah. but our 
our approach was, well, okay, let's fix them. Fix it, yeah. Rather than just wash our hands of the situation and go uh, try our fortunes elsewhere. I have read the New Testament many times. The church has been broken for a long time, George. (laughs) And, and, you know, if you... You, if you follow the Catholic conservative press, they are as exercised about what the Germans are doing, uh, what uh, Francis is doing, than uh, as we are about uh, some of the things that the Church of England and the Episcopal Church and Michael Curry and uh, Justin Welby are doing. Yeah, uh, it's just the grass is not always greener on the other side of the fence. Agreed. Let's move on to our next news story. Church of Wales is in the news. Um, and if you just left because of the Church of Wales, Michael Nazarelli, understandable. That's one of those things that we say it's something that's broken within the Anglican Communion, and that's the province of the Church of Wales. Why is it broken, George? Uh, because it's lost the Holy Spirit. Um, the Spirit has been withdrawn from certainly the leadership of the Church. Mm-hmm. There are good and kind and faithful Welsh priests recently reported on one of them withdrawing from the church in Wales to start an independent church. I'm not sure if he's uh, affiliated with EMEA, maybe not because that's in England. Uh, Anglican mission in England wouldn't work in Wales. The church in Wales, uh, its trajectory has, its downward has been long time coming. Um, It certainly was not helped by the former primate Barry Morgan, who was a political operator who put buddies into positions of influence and authority, including bishops. Barry Morgan said, we're going to have women bishops, we're going to have gay bishops. And sure enough, that's how they did it, where they appointed women bishops and a gay bishop. Well, she's actually a lesbian, Sherry Van. Um, they had their governing body meeting, and the governing body is their general assembly, if you will. and. Essentially, the decline in attendance is continuing to go down, and it's coupled with a collection of bishops who are just appalling, just appalling in their lack of pastoral sensitivity, in their lack of practical theology. Now, I know one personally, Gregory Cameron, the Bishop of St. Asaph. Hmm? I've known him when he was working with, uh, when he was Rowan Williams' uh, go-to guy. He came over for and a Gregory of the, is, uh, the uh, general conventions. Yeah, and Gregory is able. He's smart. He's energetic, um, but he is a liberal through and through. He's drunk the Kool Aid. Some of the others are liberals through and through, but they have none of the uh, adjectives. Uh, Joanna Penberthy, for instance, is the bishop of. Uh, uh, well, she's one of the bishops of the. the far western pointy end that sticks out into the Irish Sea. And she uh, was famous for having to take off a few months last year after her tweeting which she attacked the Conservative Party uh, in such vicious and ferocious terms. It was a, it's a unchristian. And she actually did so in her diocese as represented in Parliament by Conservative MPs. A woman just totally out of touch. Uh, recently, uh, with June Osborne, another woman appointed bishop, I believe, uh, is in a fight with uh, was in a fight with the dean of her cathedral. The dean of the cathedral is a former chaplain of uh, Barry Morgan, and he got that job. and He's been in trouble because he's lazy, and he's been accused of running an antiques business out of the uh, cathedral uh, rectory, and troubles and accusations that money is not spent properly. Well, the bishop has also been was accused of bullying. Well, both everybody complained, and the charges against the dean were found not to be credible, but the charges against Bishop June Osborne and her bullying were found to be credible so that they'd go to trial. Well, as they're approaching trial, the dean decides to withdraw the charges, and so everybody's happy, you know? There's no prosecution anymore because, you know, basically we got to crack down and preserve that inner circle and not expose our fighting to the world. The church is hemorrhaging members. And meanwhile, the first one of the first things the new primate does is hire an assistant bishop. 
because losing members means we need to add bishops, of course, so at least we have six members of the church in Wales by the time he's done. But the latest, what put all this in the news, because this has been percolating for years and years, is Andy John, after the recent governing body, Andy John is the primate, said that the church in Wales in five years is going to have uh, gay marriage. Not gay blessings, but gay marriage. And the bishops basically are pushing the church in that direction. It's a case of the bishops pushing until the rest of the church, yeah, in the form of the governing body, comes alongside. Yeah. Um, now, will there be any members by that time? I don't know. Uh, Ireland now, itself has changed. Greg, Gregory, yeah. Gregory Cameron's done some gay blessings, mm -hmm. but they haven't done gay marriages, weddings. Mm -hmm. And there is a distinction there. But it's well, we, the same road to perdition, if you will. Well, Ireland is church. one of those countries. Just a half dozen years ago, abortion was illegal in Ireland. And they, they mm -hmm. recently changed those laws. And uh, it was more of a conservative country, uh, although Irish. And uh, it's, uh, um, it's changing for the worse. And you can see it, especially in the Irish people, and extraordinarily in the Irish church. So. Well, in the 19th century, Wales was a site, uh, 19th and early 20th century, the Wales was a site of a Christian revival, mm -hmm. of the Welsh revivals. And now the spirit of that revival is just... I think extinct. Um, church, well, there are more people going to church in my diocese in Central Florida than all of Wales, I, I believe. Yes, yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah, all of the church in Wales. <laughs> yes. I, if if and for friends, I may have misspoken. I may have said Church of Wales. Its formal title is Church in Wales, but. If you uh, might have made spoken, mistake, I've good. definitely mistoke, spoken many times uh, with that. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to the final story. Well, what, I, what, I, what I would like people to do is to pray oh, absolutely. for the church in Wales. Mm -hmm. Pray for those faithful priests who are struggling. And the church in Wales has got a system where like one priest has got to cover seven or eight parishes. And there's mm -hmm. no way you look how blessed I am where I can be in a place for a long time, have a guy walk up to the door who hasn't been here in four years, recognize him, and be able to restart a pastoral relationship. If you've got eight parishes spread across the countryside, there's no way you could do that. Because, yeah. you know, I'm very fortunate. And pray for those Welsh priests who are in a difficult position with bad bishops dwindling congregations, dwindling money, and no real alternative leadership to engage, to encourage, to enliven and engage. It's strange because it seems that they are happy with empty pews. Well, you get empty pews when you stop preaching the gospel, when you stop what? teaching transformation, when you stop teaching you know, the good news of Jesus Christ, and this is what you're going to get. Yeah. Well, the dean who brought the charges against uh, Bishop June Osborne, he was famous for having uh, taken stress uh, sick leave for about eight months, nine yeah, months. I yeah. And I mean, yeah, yeah he, he can dress up, he can have dinner parties in his, uh, his home, but he d that means he doesn't have to take services because he's so stressed out. I'm stressed out. All right, so final story. Hey, maybe we'll get out of here early today, George. You know, it's Mother's Day weekend coming up. Yeah, we'll see. All right, so let's talk the apology tour. Now, this was a, a, a term that was coined when President Obama uh, first became president. He got on his uh, Air Force One, and he would go around the world apologizing for all the wrongs America and Western society has done to the world. He flew to Africa, he flew to Asia, he flew to uh, Europe and South America, apologizing. Because he knows how evil, especially Ronald Reagan was, uh, in uh, our colonialism, in our post-colonialist style, and how imperialist we were. And he said, I'm sorry, and it won't happen again. 
we find the same happening with Archbishop of Canterbury and I really don't mind stories saying stor sorry so much but at some point I want to hear the words from the people we're apologizing to we forgive you that's that's the whole nature of the gospel is the forgiveness part not the begging for the sorry part but that that one extra step where you are forgiven and you don't have to continue to be asked to be forgiven because it was forgiven because if you have to continue to be asked for to give to be forgiven it wasn't forgiven so george let's talk about archbishop of canterbury justin welby and his travels to the great north canada canada the Anglo canada has gone through uh a problem over its residential school system for Indians or First Nation people, whatever you want to call them. Which we have reported on three or four different episodes of Anglo Five, Unscripted. six, seven, eight, nine, ten over the last. I mean, it's it's not something that nobody, if you follow our show, we've talked about it. Yeah. Most recently, we talked about it reaching a point where there's got to be some pushback because it's being termed an Auschwitz, and it certainly wasn't it, it, such a It's thing. an Auschwitz without evidence, only yeah. accusation. And, okay, so the Anglican Church of Canada, about 15, maybe even 20 years ago, apologized to the, 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 the uh, former students who may have been abused or whatnot. So as, and the, the schools were run by the uh, Presbyterians, the Congregationalists, the Anglicans, the Catholics, on behalf of the Canadian government and the school inspectors and everything. But as in any human institution, there were some bad apples. There were some excellent schools that changed the lives of the good of people. And there were some schools and teachers that were horrible institutions mm -hmm. and harmed and maimed uh, vulnerable people. Uh, that's that's the basic fact level. On top of that, there's been some wild accusations of deliberate cultural genocide and this and that, and I, I'm not really convinced by any of that. Okay. So Welby visits Canada, and he goes to Saskatchewan, and he apologizes for a horrific evil done to the people there. Now, the problem is, this was not done by the Church of England. This was done by the Anglican Church of Canada. Uh, the Ch Anglican Church of Canada has been independent of the Church of England for over 100 and yeah, plus 50 years. Yeah. And these sins were uh, committed in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. Well, that Church would make Justin Welby a mini pope then, if he has the authority yeah. to apologize for them. Now, granted, it was called the Church of England in Canada, mm -hmm. but the Church of England in England had no authority. And Justin Welby is, a, is playing pope for apologizing for a grammatical mistake of assuming that the church in England has anything to do with this. And but the problem, my, I'm not, I don't really want to get into the actual whole residential schools controversies because that's a whole series of shows in itself. But you know, this follows an apology in West Africa to the Ghanaians over slavery. This follows an apology in Amritsar to the Sikhs uh, for, and following uh, General Dyer in 1919, putting down a, uh, civil disobedience with gunfire. What? But Justin Welby's not been to Ireland uh, to apologize uh, for the uh, uh, excesses of the British Army and the Black and Tans during the Irish Civil War. He's certainly not been to the United States to apologize to me for 400 years ago. My ancestors were forced out of England because they wouldn't conform to the Church of England. Um, basically, he's on what I would call a white apology tour. He's apologizing for whiteness and for the culture of the West to minorities and to non-European, non Western peoples sure. in Africa and in India and in Asia, and putting aside the historical evidence of good and bad, what is the value of such an apology when it's not connected to the perpetrator? I mean, am I? Can I apologize for the sins and ills of somebody else? 
what if I went to Ireland to apologize on behalf of the Church of England, I apologize on behalf of Anglicans for the damages done by in the Irish Civil War? Um, because I'm of English ancestry, 400 plus years removed, can I apologize on behalf of somebody that I'm not connected with? Well, and this is exactly the point with you know, when Obama did his tour, even the Washington Post said this is just symbolism. Mm -hmm. You know, th th this won't do anything. This won't help relations. All he's doing is itching old wounds and trying to open old scars. And I, I understand why Justin Welby wants to apologize, but it's not going to help anything if you're not going to receive the forgiveness. Well, let me give you a contrast to something that has happened the same week. Mm -hmm. The Bishop of, uh, I think, Cork, uh, of the Church of Ireland went to a village called uh, Bandon or Brandon, if you excuse me, I can't That's remember okay. which. hundred years ago during the Irish Civil War, uh, a Protestant landowner had his house invaded by three members of the IRA and a gun battle ensued and one of the IRA men was killed. In response, the IRA went on a murder spree, killing 15 yeah. Protestants yeah. in the village. This was, I think, 100 years ago. And the Bishop of Cork went to, this past week, the tomb of the dead IRA man, as well as the tombs of the dead Protestants, who were members of the Church of Ireland. And this was what you're talking about, Kevin, of... I forgive and you forgive me. In other words, I uh, we on in behalf of the Church of Ireland, we forgive the Irish Catholics, the IRA for the murder of 15 members of our church in this little village 100 years ago. And we and we reach out to the Roman Catholic Church and ask, you know, mutual forgiveness so that we can go forward. This is how it should be done. Paul Colton is the name of the bishop, mm -hmm. and he's one of the Irish liberal bishops. And I've not been, uh, I've not com commended him before, but I think this is how you do apology and reconciliation. That is a great example of the the forgiveness quotient of of the kingdom, and I have sympathy for Justin Welby in this, but. Even his own newspapers in in Britain don't buy his BS. You know, they're always saying we need somebody else because this is just all symbolism. It's all show. We don't want them in the the House of Lords anymore. Can we just get on with it? And in in as such, you know, I do I I understand what he's trying to do. He's just not doing it the way they're doing uh, with your example. I don't know. I. I don't want to always make this a show of uh, what did Justin Welby not do right today, you know, but uh, I, I well, do want to make a show of what forgiveness really is and what it really looks like, you know. I must personally confess, and I think you're probably on the same wavelength, mm -hmm. of the deep disappointment of, you know, he came, Justin Welby came into office with such high expectations mm -hmm. from evangelicals and conservatives. And he has let us down every single time. And by, by sort of betraying his base, he's not gained the popularity of the opposition. Liberals dislike him just as much as we do. Yeah. I, but they dislike him because they've, they've never trust him to do what... He, they know he's not on side, yet he constant, consistently throws his own people overboard uh, to please them. I, yeah, I... I don't get it. He's in the middle, he's in the middle of every issue, and you know, I don't know. Uh, we we may have a Justin Welby show in the future, but I, I want to be fair in this as well, uh, and, and do this as a Christian journalist, you know, and not just be the Justin Welby complaining cha channel, um, because yeah, we had a lot of hope that this could be a guy who would give an apology onto God for a church that was now teaching errant doctrine, 
that was now teaching unbiblical theology, that was allowing society and uh, zeitgeist to uh, invade its uh, seminaries. That's where the apology needed to be, Justin. We, we needed to start fresh and have a reformation within Anglicanism to stop the descent into hell with which we're going. But uh, that didn't happen. We'll have another show some other time about that. I'm enjoying Key West right now on a semi-vacation. Yes, I actually take vacations once in a while. So I don't want to raise my blood pressure on, on oh, Anglican Kevin, communion since, <laughs> leadership. Yes. Since I'm, since I'm smiling, can we do one or two tiny, small good news stories? Just, just Okay. If just you have people. really, really good news stories, you can do them. But I'm not going to re-edit and put them in the front. Okay. Well, there's a little story out of Ghana. The church, the Diocese of Accra, has just broken ground on the country's largest privately held rubber plantation. Mm -hmm. The Diocese of Accra is seeking to evangelize, and it's Ghana, the church is growing by leaps and bounds. Accra is going to be divided into two dioceses shortly, and then probably a third afterwards. And one of their and when they do talk about social justice, what do they mean? They don't mean supporting gay and lesbian rights or getting involved in domestic politics. They got the money, got a grant from a bank, bought some land that had uh, not been well maintained, and have started a rubber plantation to provide employment in the rural countryside and also provide income and support for the activities of the church. To me, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, the, not not that because the church is now capitalist and in investing uh, in farmland, but rather to help raise up its people. It's doing more than just talk. It's using its connections and its influence to start something that will provide gainful employment to people in the villages who've been left behind by the by the growth in the cities. I think that's a wonderful work of the church. Yeah, I agree. No, nope. well, that's a good story. Yeah, and I, you yeah, and but I, Kevin, we can't complain about Justin Welby because uh, uh, we, do, we don't want to, that, it, you know, complain about Justin Welby. You know, it's, it's amazing because you and I have been to Africa many times and where just the, the smallest amount of effort goes a long, long way in Africa. Mm -hmm. Where here in America, you're putting in a tremendous amount of effort and getting very, uh, <laughs> very little mileage out of it. So, yeah, these gas prices, of course. George, it's been a wonderful show. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. You've been watching episode 730 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>